Donna tonight. We are so excited. We have Dr. Judy Ho with us, and uh, we can't tell you how excited we are. Dr. Ho, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing so good. Thank you guys for having me. Yay. Oh, yeah, Yay. Yeah, we're really, Yay. Uh, in fact, Chris and I were talking earlier, you know, two old uh, beat up cops don't get giddy very often, but tonight we are, Chris. Yeah, yeah we're honored to have you here, Dr. Ho. We're, we're grateful that, uh, you know, you've carved some time out of your schedule to talk to us about, uh, you know, the cop work and, uh, you know, get it from your side. And by the way, everybody, uh, if you have not seen Dr. Ho's show, she is world famous. So uh, take a look at her uh, on uh, live TV. She's on just about every TV show you can ever, you know, come across uh, news. she got her own podcast, The Doctors, and she has a new book out. Dr. Ho, tell us about your new book. Well, thank you. My book is called Stop Self Sabotage. And it's a book that helps you to get out of your own way and achieve whatever goal you have in your career, in health and wellness or in your relationships. And so it's really a book that's rooted in science, but read so that you can actually do it over coffee and start to make really positive changes in your life. So thanks for the shout out. And for you guys who want to check out the book, you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Judy Ho, and you'll see a lot of posts about it. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic. And I assume they can get it on Amazon and just about any book uh, reseller. Uh, but, you know, it brings a really interesting question to me, Dr. Ho, and that is, what is it about our personalities that makes us our own worst enemy? Well, Mike, I think part of the problem is we are all at points ruled by fear. And that's just part of being a human because we do have to you, we have to pay attention to our fears because it sometimes helps us to survive. But unfortunately, sometimes our fear skyrockets and it starts to hold us back. We start to avoid doing the things that we know we should be doing. And now fear is not just about physical threats. It's also about emotional and psychological threats. Like, what if I do this and nobody wants to listen to me? What if I try out for this job and nobody wants to hire me? And then that's the kind of thing that ends up holding us back more so than the threats to our physical well-being. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I love listening to you because I, I was listening to some of your stuff about, you know, how you start the day. If you start the day with a negative thought and it just keeps building and keeps building yeah. and keeps building. Yeah, this is uh, very cool. I think we should get into this tonight. What do yeah, you guys we, think? We do. We're, we're so excited. When we talked to Dr. Ho, one of the things we asked her about is this idea of the psychology of a police investigation. And Chris and I are a little bit nervous, Dr. Ho, because uh, we are anticipating that you're going <laughs> to dig into some of our emotions over the course of our 30, 40 year careers. And uh, and we we want to start off and we're going to kind of follow your lead tonight. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to start psychoanalyzing you guys right now. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a batch of people that have been wanting that to happen for some time. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so, you, I, you know, yeah, would it be possible to um, one of the things that Chris and I have been talking a lot about uh, because we've been trying to help the Mormon family who are uh, the, the brother of Suzanne Morphew, who is a 49-year-old mother who disappeared on Mother's Day of this year from her home and has still not been located. He's actually organizing a, a search of volunteers who are meeting in Colorado next week uh, to, to go out into the hills and try to, to um, find Suzanne. And we wondered how you'd feel about maybe even exploring a little bit of just the psychology for those police officers that had to handle this investigation. Because frankly, they've taken a little heat too. Be, the public wants to know all the answers and, and we as police like to keep those answers kind of tucked away and hidden from people while we do our investigation. Yeah. And I, I think what people would really like to hear is why you guys do have to do that sometimes. You know, I think maybe as a lay person, they don't understand, as you were just mentioning, Mike, that sometimes you do have to keep those details under wraps because otherwise you probably would have all kinds of things that end up, you know, basically crippling the investigation rather than helping it. But maybe the layperson doesn't understand that. And obviously with this particular case, Suzanne's own husband, Barry, is the one who's trying to point the fingers at the police and saying, well, you are the ones who botched the investigation and now you're looking for a scapegoat. And I'm just an easy scapegoat because I'm the husband and, you know, 
husbands and wives are often the prime suspects. And so I think he's really capitalizing on this opportunity to point the finger somewhere else and deflect any attention from himself too. Is there a word for that? Is there, is there a, um, I mean, is there like a diagnosis of that of some sort? I mean, break that down. Well, I think, you know, obviously there's a possibility he's completely <laughs> innocent, I guess, but also more often than not, this is somebody who might have certain types of personality qualities where they don't take responsibility for anything, even when it involves the disappearance of a loved one. And we've seen this a lot of times when spouses end up actually sadly being involved in the disappearance and, and even sadly the murders of their spouses is that they start to point fingers at everybody around them. Well, it was the housekeeper. It was my brother. I mean, mm -hmm. and really they try to send the police and the detectives on this crazy search. Eventually it comes back to them because they start to mix up their stories. And so sometimes when I think about, I mean, in, in terms of a diagnosis, I don't know if there's a diagnosis per se, but it's sort of this idea that maybe you can outsmart the cops. Maybe you can mm -hmm. outsmart the seasoned professionals. I think that there's this idea that maybe a little bit of a narcissism that maybe they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they attempt it. Yeah. Interesting. Mike. That's interesting. Well, you know, and that made me think you, you, you mentioned the fact that he's actually pointed uh, several different scenarios or, or uh, well, scenario, I guess is the best word for it. Uh, let, let me just lay those out and maybe we could talk about those, Doc. It, it would be kind of interesting um, from, from what we've learned by reading in the press and, and uh, hearing from other people on, online is that uh, on early in the early morning hours on Mother's Day, he leaves for an emergency job in uh, Denver, some two and a half hour drive away from their home. <clears throat> Later that evening, around 5 p.m., he apparently learns that uh, she is nowhere to be found. And so he leaves and returns back. I, I don't know. I always found it kind of interesting. I, this is probably not even the forum for this, but my understanding was that he left Denver about five o'clock at night. But I, I know in one uh, one video, he actually, you can hear him say, I didn't get here until nine o'clock at night. So I'm wondering what that extra hour and a half is when you're racing home to, to find, find your loved one. I found that kind of weird, but there were uh, four scenarios, weren't there, Chris? Yep, there sure were. Uh, so, so Dr. Jewy, here, here are the four scenarios. Um, we've got uh, a mountain lion did it. Uh, she was in a collision Hey, mm -hmm. um, maybe it was somebody close to her or a random stranger abduction. So those are the four scenarios that have been presented. And so Mike and I have, uh, you know, we've kind of been sitting back and we, we did a little video a while ago and be interesting to talk about, you know, some of the red flags that, uh, you know, we caught and what, uh, what your feeling is on, on listening to that side of it and, and, and digging into it with us. I would love so. to hear that. Yeah, that sounds great because again, I'm always curious, what do you guys do first when you hear something like this, when you first get the report, where, yeah. where does your mind go and what's the first step? Yeah. So obviously the first thing that always comes to mind whenever, you know, uh, you're sent to an incident like this, depending on, you know, as an, from an investigator's position, you know, you're getting there and pretty much the scene is, uh, you know, been contained and or some folks have been identified who may have witness information, right? From a patrol officer situation, you know, that's a whole different ball game because that mindset is more of an officer safety and, and that kind of thing. Mike, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's that's right, Doc. And, and the idea is you show up at the scene and you're trying to assess, is this person just mad at the family and decided to go to Vegas for the weekend? Or is there something really goofy going on and they've disappeared under under some kind of a criminal kind of a, a cloud? And so you, you immediately start talking to people and you try to weigh out and, and kind of sift through all of that. And, and I've been thinking a lot about, uh, especially lately with all of the discussion about whether law enforcement should have uh, um, mental health providers or social service professionals 
in the patrol car with them to go in. What, what, what would be some of the things that you would have asked when you showed up at that home to try to assess where people are in the information they're providing? I think so much for me when I see somebody right after something like this has happened. And as you were mentioning, I mean, sometimes it's just they just got mad at their family and they're running away for the weekend. But if it really feels like something nefarious has happened, then that means that the family unit is likely going through some type of trauma. And so at that time point, it's really just about listening and observing more because everybody's response to trauma is so different. Some people get extremely angry and erratic. Some people become really quiet. They become very withdrawn. They don't want to speak to anybody. And even some other people, when they've already had a pre-existing mental illness, it could be the moment where they have a break and they could potentially be at risk for harming themselves or other people. And so I think so much of what I do, if I was to arrive on the scene in those beginning stages, is just observing what type of scenario I'm stepping into before offering the support. Because if somebody is in a rage moment and you're trying to get them to calm down and talk to them in a way that they find inciting and condescending, you could end up actually aggravating them even more. Yeah, interesting. What were you going to say? I, I, well, it makes me think. Um, I, I, I would, I would love to see, and I wish public budgets could afford to have that mental health provider sitting with a cop because you need that uh, gut sense that a cop has that there's something wrong here, and you need that analytical sense that the mental health provider brings to say, "I'm sensing these kinds of personality traits." And uh, it, it really would be interesting. And I wonder if we'll ever really get to the point that, that the public can afford to do that. But let's talk about a couple of those scenarios and, and maybe a couple that we brought off the table pretty quickly, Dr. Ho. One was that she was uh, taken by a mountain lion and carried away and consumed by this mountain lion. And uh, as we looked at that, we actually brought in experts from the Mountain Lion Foundation on one of our shows a few weeks ago. And we talked about the behavior of a mountain lion and what the radius is that that mountain lion would actually take and drag its prey, how it would cache its prey, which is the burying and hiding of, of the body so that they could come back and continue to, to uh, use it as a food source. And all of those probabilities pointed to a very small area. In fact, uh, if you don't mind, we're going to pull up a quick little map here just to show you something that we showed to our viewers uh, back then. This this is the area where this occurred, and here is the the home where Suzanne would have uh, left from. This is the area where her bike was recovered, and uh, and so the question became: Was she going or was she coming? But as we looked at that uh, mountain lion scenario. And we talked to those experts. Here's the thing that we found, and we're going to just do it real quickly. A mountain lion will cover about a 450-foot range with its prey. That's that's about the maximum that it will ever take something. And, and they say a maximum weight for a mountain lion is a 100-pound deer or something like that. So this is a woman who's just slightly over that. But then they said the interesting thing is that the cougar will only drag that individual downhill so it's not going to drag its prey uphill and that it generally likes to try to get near water sources and big trees where it can can hide that person. So as we looked at that and we looked at where uh, the sheriff's office initially uh, did a grid search, which was this area just to the, to the bottom of the screen, um, it, it made sense that they checked and, and cleared that area. And of course, the one thing I really liked about that particular scenario was the mountain lion expert said there is just no way that you would have this kind of a violent assault without some physical evidence on the ground to support that. And of course, there wasn't any uh, of that. And uh, and so for us, it was you know one of those moments where you say, yeah, possible, maybe, but probable, uh, no, no. 
So what are your thoughts there, Doc, on that? <laughs> well, first of all, I love that you guys talk to a mountain lion expert. I learned something new today. I didn't know that about mountain lions, but it kind of makes sense that they would go for, you know, the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, in terms of once they get their prey, they're not going to do something completely crazy and try to drag it uphill. That's a lot of work. <laughs> so they're going to drag it downhill and they're going to try to do it in a short distance so that they can kind of get things going and, uh, you know, deal with deal with their prey as they will. So yeah. I, I think that that's really interesting. That's one of the things that I thought of because obviously this mountain lion hypothesis was put forward by Barry, her husband. And it doesn't make sense because as mentioned, there would be some kind of physical evidence on the ground, the blood track, something, and it's spotless, right? So I, it makes me think about, because obviously I know that the victim's brother is saying something doesn't seem right. It kind of seems like somebody maybe even threw the bike over maybe to plant some kind of evidence so that people would be led down the wrong track. It would make sense that whoever did this would throw the bike at a place very far away from where her body actually is. If there's going to be a body to be found. Yeah. Interesting. You know, to, back to uh, the beginning, right doc, where, so one of the things that we used to call that uh, is DLR. Uh, don't look right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, when you'd get there and you'd start, you know, surveying what's going on, listening, observing, and kind of paying attention, uh, you know, you pick up on those little granular, you know, nuggets with inside of the, you know, that behavior and, and also with inside of the crime scene as a whole. Um, I know when I started years ago, I had a guy uh, who was a mentor to me. And he said, you know, what you need to do when you, when everything is processed and it's, you know, every, we, as you know, bag and tag it, right. Once it's mm -hmm. all bagged and tagged and everything is, is, uh, sitting right, you need to get a chair and you need to sit, mm -hmm. uh, and in the room and you need to look at each wall for about 15 or 20 minutes and turn the chair and do that four times and do a whole 360. And you really get a sense of, you know, some of the minutiae details with inside. And that, that's, that helped me a lot through, through my mm -hmm. cases, cases. And one of the most interesting things Mike and I heard uh, when this whole thing went down was a video uh, that uh, Barry had done. And he talked a lot of uh, we, us, them, they. Uh, mm -hmm. and that kind of struck us pretty hard. What, 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 what does that, uh, say to you? What, what goes through your mind, you know, from your experience and your professional, you know, counsel? Well, a lot of that is deflecting the individualism of who he is and what he does and his actions, right? So when you use this collective language, whether it's we or they, you're either saying the blame has to go to somebody who is not <clears throat> part of me It's a collective. That's not part of me or the blame is spread among a group of people rather than just myself and not using I language sometimes is a red flag because you're not saying that you're involved in anything, whether it's a thought process an action, a follow-up, what happened before it, it basically is sort of diffusing your identity in the situation. And one other thing I thought of Chris and Mike is, how common is it when somebody is a suspect um, that they're offering you explanations for what might have happened? Yeah, like good is doing here. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, never. I mean, okay. <laughs> me, me, no, I'm teasing. Like that, that whole point that you just made, it's that's how they do it, right? They just present, oh, by the way, let us tell you what happened and what's interesting in that the very beginning of that video remember mike he says to to tyson he says uh here let me tell you uh what happened or something to that effect and immediately mike and i looked at each other and went what did he just say <laughs> you know and it's like oh, okay we've we've ridden this horse for a couple of times see where it goes right so anyway mike what do you think <laughs> well you know so so um Dr. Ho, I, I guess I would I would want to just hear from you. If you were able to take your time machine back and you're now sitting down with um, the neighbor and the family or those intimate circle folks and interviewing them, 
what are the kinds of things you're going to be interested in in the behaviors you're seeing and the responses you're getting? I think what I would be interested in is really what happens in between what people say. So I think nonverbals are extremely important to watch for. And also how people say the things that they do. So what we have found about people who are great liars is that oftentimes it's not like, oh, liars look up to the right, whereas truth tellers look down to the left. It's really not that simple, but it's more about the way in which they respond when other people are speaking and how they're watching other people or the time in between when they're not speaking. I think those types of nonverbals are really much more important. And, and sometimes it doesn't mean that that person has any guilt in terms of the person's disappearance, but it's more about the loved ones or neighbors, people who know them, and, and maybe knowing something about their relationship. And in this case, Suzanne and Barry's relationship that perhaps isn't common knowledge, isn't public knowledge. And even Suzanne's brother said, I've been speaking to Suzanne's friends and it seems that she has confided in at least one of them that maybe things weren't going that hot in the marriage, but that wasn't a common knowledge amongst their circles. Right. And I mean, in some ways it's like, well, that could mean nothing because whose relationship is perfect, mm -hmm. but it could also provide a potential for a motive, especially if the couple was so intent on hiding that side of their relationship from people who know them. <laughs> this, this, this is so fun uh, because I'm having these flashbacks, Chris, of other cases, and I'm sure you are as well. Um, Judy, one of the cases that I remember working was uh, the case, uh, and, and I was actually working it much after the fact uh, as, as more of a profiler, but I was serving on the VICAP uh, National Board as a chairman, and I was with a Philadelphia police detective. If you ever remember the case of Marie No, this is a woman in Philadelphia who uh, murdered uh, eight of her children over the course of different times, and they were Munchausen by proxy uh, mm -hmm. homicides. But I remember this detective, as he was interviewing her, he started off, and this is the point I'm trying to make is that to really understand people's behavior, you need to invest more than a 15 minute interview at the scene with, with people. And he spent time talking about her life and growing up. And, and uh, the thing that became really important that nobody ever picked up on was he talked to her about her first kiss and the movements and the facial expressions when she talked about her first kiss. And I hope everybody that's listening today is thinking about that first kiss or something like that. Because at that moment, he got to see true uh, emotional responses to something so that when he started pushing her harder on the death of the children, he could tell when she was lying. And those are just techniques you learn over the course of your, your investigative experience. But at the end, uh, um, and this man who's now an inspector in the Philadelphia Police Department, he, uh, he finally slammed his fist down on the table and he said, Marie, how come you can tell me about the first kiss you had, but you can't tell me about killing your kids? Hmm. And she calmly looked at him and said, well, I guess it's time to share everything. And she then confessed to the murders. But uh, my, my long drawn out story is to, to get a point across. How do we help train investigators today that you can't invest 15 minutes in a major case and expect to understand the personality of an individual. It's a really good point because I think obviously you guys are inundated with work. There's a lot to get through and perhaps sometimes it feels like, okay, I just got to get the interview, get it recorded or documented and then move on to the next thing that I have to do. But as you just mentioned, 15 minutes is never enough to know about somebody. And as a neuropsychologist, I spend hours at a time evaluating my patients, right? And so it's not just 50 minutes of a therapy hour. It's I spend 8, 10, 12, 14 hours with these patients. And the first couple hours, they might be able to hold certain things together. But like by the end of the day, when the defenses are worn down or when they get comfortable or when the rapport is finally established, that's when you can really tell the difference between what I think you were just describing right now, Mike, as a baseline that you've been able to obtain 
and then something that's more aggravated or heated and you're actually trying to get more information about and is there a difference and so in, in many ways it's almost like the way that polygraphs are used except obviously polygraphs are not very reliable and i actually think human observation experience might actually be more reliable if you know how to get a, a correct baseline and yep. then measure that against the type of behavior or action or thought that you're really trying to assess and i love that idea of asking about somebody's first kiss because who would ever think about that on a daily basis i mean unless you're totally living in the past that's not what you're thinking about most days and so i think you'd be taken aback by that question and it would be a surprising way to get a baseline okay, interesting yeah. Yeah, the, the um, okay, so here, here's a, a guy who goes to a supermarket and uh, he's outside. Uh, we have firsthand information that he's looking through a trash can. Uh, and he then knocks on the door of a supermarket. And uh, we have not shared this with anybody yet till tonight. Uh, and this kid opens the door and this individual turns and says, uh, hey, I'm looking for a baby blue bicycle helmet. Anybody seen one in the trash out here? Uh, and the kid goes, what? And then the clerk comes over and ends up uh, getting a note uh, about a baby blue helmet, uh, wife, and uh, bicycle clothes, but no description of, uh, of anybody. Uh, what does that ring uh, to you when um, you you hear that first story or that statement uh, if you were that uh, individual interviewing that witness what do you what's it say to you the uh, witness who the witness who recovered the I items or or there is no item like that but the uh, mm -hmm. Barry drops that as a uh, another uh, nugget uh, in uh, hey I'm looking for a baby blue bicycle helmet what what uh, you know where do you go with that, right? You're looking for your wife or you're looking for a helmet? Which which one is yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, again, I think that to me, that kind of just signals somebody who's just wildly grasping at straws at this point, right? Because really, it doesn't, it's not that uh, sensical in terms of how he's going about this. If he's trying to proclaim his innocence and look like somebody who shouldn't be a person of interest, a lot of the things that he's doing are completely, uh, just they're non-logical. And I think this is what happens though when somebody is under a lot of stress and he is because he knows he's a person of interest and it's literally like he's just, it's it's like you're, you're trying to hold on to something and okay, the mountain lion thing does, it doesn't seem to be working. They're not buying that. Like, let me try to do this other thing. And I don't think that a lot of it's well thought out, but it's like the way that you try to behave when you're in absolute crisis and you're trying to use your executive functions and they don't work, you know, because that's not where your brain is at in terms of its optimal functioning. You're you're in kind of some type of a fight or flight mode. And actually, when we're in fight or flight mode, it's really primordial. It's more just like, get us out of here. We just need to survive. Like, you're not actually able to carry out fantastical plans. And so to me, it kind of seems like he's been in this prolonged state for a while. And the more he realizes he might be in trouble, the more he's doing things that don't make sense. Interesting. So it's, um, do they go into this path in your experience? Do you see this pattern consistently start to, you know, they start to just kind of build this behavior and just keeps building. Where does it go from here? I mean, in terms of what you've seen in, in, uh, you know, in the clinical psychology end of things. Yeah. You know, I think in the beginning, you usually see that the person is generally still put together. And even if their excuses don't make sense, they kind of seem calm and they're able to entertain questions and all of that. But, you know, as the investigation wears on, you start to see this sort of um, degradation of their mental state. And eventually some of these people will crack and they'll confess. Mm -hmm. Other times I have seen people use the uh, excuse of, okay, I'm having a mental break because my loved one has disappeared and maybe they're dead. And they check themselves into the hospital to try to evade arrest and further investigation. Interesting. And then, and then even as a third scenario, they really do have a mental break and they're in the hospital because they truly have completely had a psychotic break from all of the stress that has been compounding. Yeah. Mike, uh, what, so, so be, being a devil's advocate here, Doc, um, and could it be that 
you are so distraught with the disappearance of your wife and maybe your social skills aren't like those of others who say, this is what I do or that's what I do, that you just flat are not dealing with this and, and you're becoming incredibly disorganized because of that pressure? I think it's very possible that somebody just becomes disorganized because they're truly distraught and they're just behaving in ways that don't make sense. But I also think that in this particular case, there's a number of things that make it seem like he should still remain a person of interest. And that's why I was asking earlier, how often do you guys get somebody who is just the loved one of uh, somebody who has disappeared and they're offering you scenarios of why they disappeared that clearly don't make any sense. I mean, it'd be one thing if you're like, well, I don't know, you know, I actually just learned recently that she has a boyfriend. So I wonder if she ran off with her boyfriend, that would be one thing, but the mountain lion, I mean, it kind of comes out of nowhere. And yeah. he was conveniently away when this was all happening too, almost like he was trying to establish an alibi for himself. So there's just some things that don't add up to me. You know, how about his familiarity being a hunter? Do you think that could have played a role into, you know, this analogy of that he presented there, you know, the mountain lion? What What's your thought on that? Well, if he's a hunter, then he might have some of the expert knowledge that your expert had when you guys interviewed the mountain lion expert. And I think he would know that that doesn't make sense. <laughs> That'd be a pretty good deflection. Yeah. Go ahead. It's been, been interesting because that uh, that scenario has not been discussed since then. But but there is another scenario, <laughs> and that, that one's one that maybe would be kind of fun to move into. Uh, and again, as Chris and I were throwing up red flags, the second was – this idea that the bicycle um, ended up in the bottom of the ravine as a result of an accident, either forced off the road by a vehicle or it was because of the cougar that attacked or that she just isn't paying attention and rides off the road. But we have not been able to recover anything. And of course, the police are holding all of this very closely to the vest, so we don't know the answers. But there's nothing, according to even the brother Andy who shows up the following day uh, to suggest there's any artifact supportive of a skid mark off the road or uh, mm. damaged brush down below or um, bark ripped off of trees, anything like that. But if we were to step back, there were also interesting things about the way the bike was reported. And maybe, Chris, you could give that to Dr. Hall. and We could just ask a little bit about uh, her thoughts in that regard. So we have, well, we have a couple of pieces of this puzzle that Mike and I have uh, sorted through here. And one of them is, um, so we are aware that uh, he may have actually bought a bike a week before the um, problem. Uh, we're not going to go into that because it could have been something for parts uh, for her bike and one of the local bike shops would have fixed it. Uh, mm -hmm. But we find it interesting that there could be something uh, in the environment where a bike was um, purchased prior to her disappearance. And then when you have the bike, uh, discovered what we've learned is it was positioned with almost, uh, I think the wheel up and mm -hmm. uh, he knew about that positioning uh, and he caught himself uh, in the statement. Uh, and Mike and I thought that was an interesting red flag as a whole. So uh, what are your thoughts uh, as, as we went down that lane there? Wow. <laughs> if he knew the positioning of the bike, meaning that the wheel was up, it just seems like there's way too many details. I mean, was he there when the bike fell down, pushed down, whatever happened, you know, it just, I mean, cause who would know that except yeah. for the people who actually recovered the bike. And if nobody in the investigation told him about that, then there should be no reason why he would know of that. And it makes me think just about these other things that don't make sense. And again, his idea of deflecting the blame once again, where he had these two contractors, uh, Gentile and Puckett, and they went to this Holiday Inn where Barry asked them to stay. And at that point, 
Barry's hotel room was vacant. So one of the contractors, Puckett, moved into Barry's room and said that he found wet towels saturated with the smell of chlorine all over the floor. And then when they questioned Barry about it, he said, oh yeah, I, I smelled it too. And you know what? It, it must be from the pool or the washing agent for the hotel's linens. Again, it's like, I'm not really sure that's the first place you would go if somebody comes to you and says, hey, we found a bunch of wet towels with chlorine smell in your room. Would the first answer be, oh, totally. And also it's because the hotel probably uses a type of agent that smells like that. Right, it, for COVID-19. Right, for, yeah. For COVID-19, yeah. You know, yeah, of yeah. course they spray the hotel with yeah. chlorine. Yeah, it just seems like it's too convenient. Like he he has an idea for everything that yeah. people are asking him about. Interesting. Yeah, another interesting thing about that bike scenario to us was that the manner in which it's actually reported. And there are a couple of stories out there about how the bike becomes part of the story. One, one is that uh, the neighbor just says she was out for a bike ride there's other evidence that more strongly suggests that uh, there was a phone call made to check on Suzanne. The neighbor couldn't find her in the home, goes inside, goes back and says, no, not there. And then then it, the bike is introduced. Well, maybe she's on a bike ride. Go back and see if the bike's there. And then the neighbor reports that the bike's gone and that starts to elevate the uh, concern with law enforcement. Um, so again, this idea that it has to be reintroduced to get it to be part of the narrative is troubling. How does that strike you? Yeah, you know, to me, I feel like it, it might be a case where Suzanne was known to be quite athletic. And so this idea of her maybe just going on a bike ride on her own wouldn't be a foreign idea for somebody who is athletic and enjoys being outdoors. And even to put that together with the fact that perhaps he picked up a bike a few days before, um, if all of those uh, elements are true, it's almost like he felt like this would be a believable scenario to to pin her disappearance on, oh, you know, she being as athletic as she is, she was just on a bike ride and, you know, an untoward accident happened while she was doing it. Um, because it's, it's a good, it's a good scenario that people would believe about somebody like Suzanne who enjoyed the outdoors and was very athletic and participated in outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, yeah, we are dying to see what this bike looks like. I, I sure <laughs> wish we could see if there are, um, artifacts from a, a collision on that bike. Yeah. I'm sorry. Chris. Mike. No, that's all right, Mike. Let's take uh, Doctor. Let's take a, uh, a deep breath here for a minute. I want to. I want to introduce uh, Doctor Ho to the, our audience that's been joining with us. We've got uh, almost a thousand plus people uh, on uh, live here. So, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, folks, we've got Doctor Judy Ho, who is a triple board certified and licensed clinical and forensic uh, neuropsychologist and tenured associate professor at Pepperdine University and a published author of her new book uh, that's been out, Stop Self-Sabotage. Uh, uh, it's a six-step program that's been translated into seven different languages around the world. Wow. That is awesome. Uh, <laughs> she maintains a private practice in Manhattan Beach uh, she's a regular uh, in many appearances on TV, podcast, uh, radio, uh, follow her on Twitter, follow her on Instagram. We are just so blessed to have her here tonight. And she's, uh, uh, she's going to pick our brains here a little bit more as we go forward about police investigations. We've been kind of beating up the Morphew case here a little bit. And um, uh, because, you know, in, in all sincerity, I, I think all of us, are really worried about uh, this young lady. I mean, she goes out and for almost three months, Dr. Ho, almost three months, she was MIA. She just evaporated from the in environment. And her dear brother reached out to Mike and I and said, hey, uh, there's just too much going on here. I need to find my sister. And, you know, we have this platform here and we said, you know, Andy, uh, there are there are a lot of people around the world that uh, are connecting with your sister right now. Uh, how can we help? And he's organizing a search for next week. 
uh, where um, I think he's got like 500 plus volunteers right now, Mike. And, and yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's going to be phenomenal. And um, um, so, you know, when when we when we got involved in this channel, you know, as you know, investigators, you know, former gumshoes, as we call. Uh, I told Mike I would lower his uh, property value, and I, I think I think I'm still true to that uh, opinion. But um, you know, one of the most interesting things that I learned, um, you know, back in the day, and I still sit on the Cold Case Foundation. So we're, in fact, I was working two cases today out of Texas for for some families and some agencies down there. And you know, one of the things in, that Mike and I have always learned is to kind of slow down and decompress mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Um, and I think we picked up, you know, and Mike, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think I picked up so much just by, you know, just taking it all in uh, for a moment. Like you, you said earlier on when we first started was, you know, what goes through your mind, you know, in terms of, you know, how um, we connect, but, I, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm an optimist and I, I have a, I have a positive mental attitude and I don't know if that's weird. So maybe you can tell me tonight, but I got chastised one time for being in a, in a trial and smiling by, by the defense, the, the defendant said to his attorney and this, the defendant said to his attorney, he says, you know, that guy's always smiling and long, <laughs> long story short, they, they, they dismissed everybody and they brought each juror back in one at a time and asked him if detective McDonough smiling was influencing their, uh, their opinion. Yeah, wow. I know. And then I got admonished by the judge to no longer smile. You have no idea how much I wish for that COVID mask uh, back then, but uh, we didn't have that problem. But uh, is it, is, can you maybe let folks understand that, you know, humor is such a, a great, um, important piece of um, some of the violence and the trauma that we've you know seen. You know, what's your what's your take on that? You know, humor and optimism and hope is what we all need more of right now. Okay, but I don't think it's that easy. And so maybe perhaps people are looking at you and they're thinking, how could this person do what he does? See the grotesque you know, realities of what humans can do to one another and still be smiling. But I also feel like if you weren't, how could you survive in your career, in your industry? You so go. I'm totally with you. You know, I've definitely testified on the stand before and had a slight smile on my face, um, especially when I'm being cross-examined by opposing attorney and they're asking me questions to try to throw me off my game and I'm smiling at them. And They'll tell me after the fact because, you know, a case is a case and then you're human beings talking after a trial. And they're like, that was very unnerving that I was asking you questions that should make you upset and maybe even angry because I was trying to make it look like you're emotional and then you're not a good expert. And in fact, you were just smiling at me. It kind of threw me off like, wait, like she just seems like, you know, that that's that's part of, I think, my coping mechanism is to try to stay calm. And there's a lot of research that says that even when you don't feel like it, if you force a smile, it actually sets off a whole chain of neurochemicals in your brain that actually does lift your mood. And we all need a little bit of that when we're dealing with really serious things. Interesting. Mike, what were we going to say, buddy? <laughs> well, no, no I, I, I mean, I think we all have been in that position where we get challenged about being uh, maybe too happy. Sometimes it's our own our own reflex to avoid looking so shocked and disgusted too. Yeah. And uh, I, I was thinking today even about a, a case I worked many years ago where someone confessed to sexually assaulting children hundreds of times. And I acted like I heard it every single day. And the, and the person said, well, you must, the way you're acting, this must be something you see all the time. Well, what he what he didn't realize was in my brain, I was thinking, holy cow, how on earth am I going to process this and make sense of it? And uh, mm -hmm. you you probably get it, Dr. Ho. I mean, we're, we're kind of new at this, but uh, we just smile at all of the people that just tell <laughs> us how goofy we are and how many dumb things we do. 
And uh, and I just think, oh boy, it, sometimes that's just the only way you know how to respond at the, the moment. And uh, right. I don't know what I'm saying, but anyway. No, I, I hear you, Mike. I mean, sometimes I laugh when I'm nervous. Sometimes I laugh when things aren't funny. I mean, I just, some sometimes that's the only response you've got, especially when something's really shocking, you know? And I think that that is very common for, for humans to just use laughter to deflect a uncomfortable situation too. So I don't know. I don't think we could have too much laughter, honestly. I mean, it's it's one thing if somebody is a serial murderer and laughing as he's describing killing and mutilating his victims. But yeah, if you laugh be because you're a little... Right. Yeah. That, that means that you might be like a straight up psychopath, born evil type of a person. Right. But, but in like 99% of other scenarios, I don't think laughing is such a terrible thing. And we should all learn to laugh at ourselves. I mean, one of the things I was talking to some of my patients about is, you know, what's really great is like when you can make fun of yourself, like tell a story that's self-deprecating. Everybody loves you for it. They love yeah. it when you poke fun at yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have dentures. I meaning, if you listen to everybody and the way I talk, I have dentures. I have a lisp. I was drunk. That one, one somebody wrote in the comment, this guy's a drunk. You know, I'm like, okay. You know, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I wasn't, you know, and I don't drink, but that's okay. You know, so I, I love that. Absolutely. I mean, we used to fill each other's lockers with bags of potatoes. And so when the guy opened up his locker, you know, you see all these potatoes come rolling out. And guys would just, you know, guys and gals, we just start cracking up. And, you know, we put a dead raccoon one night in the back of, um, in the front seat of a guy's car. You know, it was roadkill. And it was a shift change. And these guys are coming in. And on his seat, right, just underneath, we put his, so that the thing is looking up at the guy. So when he looked down as he's leaving the station, he, you know, he blew a gasket, Right. We thought that was the funniest thing in the world, you know, because everybody's driving by saying, you know, good luck yep. with that. And meanwhile, the <laughs> radio's cracking and you're taking off to crazy calls and stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, no, that's I, I love humor. I've always loved it. And yeah. um, it's got you through. It's got me through a lot anyway. So yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, do you guys find right now, especially, I mean, there is just so much negative information in the news and obviously it's crazy. the pandemic is still ongoing. I mean, it's just difficult. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's like humor. You have to use humor to save yourself. And so I always watch at the end of my day. I mean, after reading the news and seeing patients and dealing with really serious stuff at the end of the day, I really need to relax and I need to like sink into something that's humorous. And so my latest um, passions has, have been watching Cobra Kai on Netflix and learning magic <laughs> tricks. I mean, really, really? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a term for this in psychology. It's called regression. It's like you're regressing to a time when things were simpler. And it's like when I was a child watching Cobra, Cobra Kai, but not Cobra Kai, then it was Karate Kid, right? And right. then also like watching magic and being taken with magic tricks. Like, oh my gosh, how do they do that? Right? I, and I feel like that's partially my coping skill right now is like going back into a time in childhood where things were simpler. <laughs> Interesting. Amazing. Hey, Doc, <laughs> would, this, this is uh, now, now we're going to turn the tables a little bit on you. Um, what what would you say was the most difficult case you personally dealt with that impacted you and you were constantly in conflict between your need to be professional and the way in which the case was impacting you? And hopefully you can talk about that case in a way that's generic enough to to share that. I think some of my most difficult cases, I, I really can't pinpoint one, but I can think of a, a collection and they're always ones that involve severe abuse and mutilation of children, um, mm -hmm. especially really young children who can barely even speak and can't express themselves. And it's just really difficult because as a forensic psychologist, I actually have to look at some of the evidence and mm -hmm. it becomes really difficult because I have to do it. I have to do it for my job. but then it becomes very hard to have that boundary of, okay, you know, you still have to protect your own personal boundaries, but still understand enough about the case and empathize enough to really be able to talk about the psychology of what happens to these children. And unfortunately, some of them were deceased, you know, so then that's also like, wow, like if somebody had just paid attention a little earlier or caught this a little earlier, maybe they would be alive. But even if they were alive, what kind of lives would they lead when 
their entire childhood has been one of severe trauma and abuse. And so I think it's always hard when I feel like the person has no way of speaking or no way of communicating their pain. And then the human imagination is left to sort of fill in the pieces. And as you guys probably know, the human imagination sometimes is even worse than the physical evidence that you'd see because you would imagine maybe even bigger atrocities than what actually happened. And so I think those are always tough for me. And then of course, then there's like the legal logistics of the case, like, okay, you have to testify, you have to do this, you have to do that. There's deadlines and you still have to meet them. Um, and you still have to speak about it in a way that feels professional, but isn't overly emotional, but you don't want to be that person who's too stoic either. So sometimes it can be hard to draw that line of where can you still feel the empathy and be able to talk about that, but then not let it bleed in so much into your own personal life that it's hard for you to sleep. And then, you know, it's harder for you to focus on that case and other ones. Yeah. No, that's such an interesting dynamic. I'm sorry, Mike, did I cut you off? Oh, I, I, because, wanted follow, I wanted to follow yeah, up with ahead. just, uh, so, uh, Judy, how do you take care of that when it's impacting you personally? And, and, uh, and I'm asking this as the cop who had to figure out how I'm going to go home and deal with that, uh, three-year-old child that, that was uh, beaten to death. And now I have a three-year-old child at home and all I see is the, the case I handled at the end of my shift. How do you and where do you get the help to work through those kinds of things? I think ultimately it is really important to still have some type of boundary for yourself. I think it's become harder actually during the pandemic because so much of my work is from my home office. But before my commute would be the time where it's like when I walk in the door, I put that aside until the next day, right? It's a little harder when you're working from home because all you have is the separation of like an actual door of your office to your living room. And I think you have to come up with other ways to do that. And so I I have actually started to create just like a evening walk for myself where I just go and take a walk and I think about what happened, what I still have to work on. And then when I return from that walk, that's when the delineation stops of, okay, then you have to set that aside till tomorrow. And then the other piece is like really trying to establish control somehow. So like, again, I think this applies to everybody right now as the pandemic wears on. People feel out of control. They feel kind of like they don't know when things are going to end or start. So it's really about focusing on what you can control. So maybe I can't save the kids who are deceased, right? But there's still a couple of kids who are alive in this situation. And I think that it's important to be able to highlight the psychology of what has happened to them in such a way that they get all the services that they need, that they have all the funding that they need to be able to get back on their feet and to be able to heal from the trauma. Because I do believe that healing can happen. It's just that for some of these children, it's going to take years and years and years. And every time there's a big transition in their life from becoming an adult, going to school, uh, getting married, everything's going to come back up because with these new opportunities is just another opportunity also for their trauma to come back and haunt them and to like make them feel like they're not enough or they're not capable. And so I think really focusing on the things that I can control and the ways in which I can still help is important for me to maintain some sanity. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you, I think for our viewers to help, help them understand, obviously you, I mean, you're, you're called as a, as an expert witness, I mean, on numerous cases, I mean, some of the most high profile cases that are, are rocking and rolling there in Southern California. And so, you know, you uh, folks, I mean, she's going out by the courts being appointed to go do, you know, psychological assessments. I mean, Mike and I were the guys that would just kind of put them there. And then, you know, Dr. Judy would come behind us and say, well, you know, this guy's here because he's X, Y, and Z. And uh, so that's it. That's, yeah, that's a different dynamic. I've never really, you know, uh, you know, I know other people, you know, such as yourself, you know, in that, in that arena down there. And, but I never thought about, you know, what they're thinking, right. Going home. Right. Do you think about what we're thinking going home? Yeah. I was wondering what you guys are thinking, especially because sometimes you see the worst of the worst. I mean, a forensic psychologist is different from like a forensic pathologist, right? So forensic pathologists are the ones who like go to the scene and they take blood samples and they're looking at the physical evidence as it's happening. For me, the most physical evidence I have to look at is through a photograph or through a video. You know, I don't usually show up on the scene. I'm not usually involved in the case until much later. So I do wonder how two of you, Chris and Mike, how do you cope, you know, when you go home and 
you know what's on your plate, you know, you have to deal with it, obviously, in the morning. But like, how do you create that separation? And also, sometimes maybe there isn't a clean separation, because you could get that call at 2am in the middle of the night, hey, we had this big break. In this case, you got to get down here right away. You know, we need to speak about this. So like, how did you guys deal with that and still maintain some level of equanimity? Mike, you start. <laughs> That was, a question, that was a question to Mike. I could see it. So when, when I was in college, Doc, I uh, was an attendant in a psych unit. And uh, this amazing psychiatrist named Dr. Clark Summers, uh, one night I uh, had, had given someone who had finally got papers, they were cleared to go home, and uh, we, we had them checked out. And he said, hey, can I get a razor and shave before I meet my family? And he was happy. He was upbeat. He went into the shower and he slit his throat from ear to ear. And when I went in to check on him, I, obviously he was deceased by that point. I was really shook up by that. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Summers taught me two important things. One is that, that when offenders or people who are dealing with uh, psychological traumas make a decision like it's I'm going to commit suicide. It's finally a decision that makes sense to him. And that's why this particular person, he said, felt so relieved that he finally came up with an option that made sense to him. And he said, but the thing that you have to be able to do is you have to walk away and not let their behavior dictate your behavior. They, these are people that are responsible for driving their own vehicle. And, and, and I took that it was kind of a life lesson for me, but I took that into law enforcement and I put my life into buckets. When I was at home, I tried to not even talk police work. I was the kind of cop that never carried an off-duty weapon. I tried to just compartmentalize that. But when I went to work at night, I didn't have a family or anything else in my vision. I just kind of went and I was really intense and did my job that way and never uh, or rarely did the two universes collide. But when they did, like a child and having a child at home that I couldn't think of, it became really difficult. And, and at that point, I, I personally had to rely on faith leaders and my own personal faith, um, my own personal faith belief uh, to kind of work through that and realize that some things I will never understand, but they're not mine to own. They were somebody else's. So there's my rambling. I mean, and I think that that that's that's really helpful to to know your perspective of how you get through things and i think the compartmentalization is needed in whatever way you can find it i mean i know that sometimes it's not possible to have the compartmentalization be super clean you know it's like you do your best and sometimes it still it still bleeds over but i think it's important for everybody to hear that because i it is it is a part of you everybody has to recharge somehow it doesn't matter if you're a detective or a cop or a doctor or it doesn't matter like if you can't, if you don't recharge, you can't serve your community. I mean, that's just like the bottom line. Yeah. How about you, Chris? Uh, well, Dr. Judy didn't ask me, so uh, you know, I did, I did ask you. <laughs> I did. I did. I did ask you, Chris. I asked both of you, but you, but you said I wanted Mike to answer first, and you pointed out uh, that that is window. correct. <laughs> All right, touche. So, um, <laughs> you know, for me, it was, um, you know, and it still is. Uh, I, I don't know. I just think, um, you know, I have a couple of, I have vents obviously. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I came from a very independent mom. Uh, mm -hmm. my mother was in the Marine Corps and my father was in the Marine Corps. So, wow. uh, yeah. I, and, and, uh, both of my parents are buried in Arlington. So I, I grew up pretty quickly as a kid. Uh, and when I was younger, you know, we went through some things where my mother, you know, she had uh, stage four cancer when I was 12. Uh, and so we, we lived through, uh, you know, some, some things and I ended up being, becoming very independent. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, but I remember as a young boy, I was eight years old, actually. And my mom said, uh, you need to get, uh, to school. And mm. so I used to take the subway uh, in Boston. Uh, we lived in Milton at the time. And I used to take this, the green line to the red line and get off at Ashmont Station and walk down Dorchester Avenue uh, to a school called St. Mark's. 
And I was eight and nine because my dad was in Vietnam. So mm -hmm. I had this sense of, and my mother in, in, you know, implanted in me, right, at a very young age, because I think she knew that she was going to have some these issues later on. So she and my dad was, in, you know, he was always overseas or doing something. And uh, by the way, he, he was in Taiwan, Taipei, by the way. Mm. You know, yeah, just as a... That's where I was born. <laughs> as a side note, okay. Right, so long story short, I think I took that into police work. Uh, mm. And, but I had this, I, I, I just had this sense of, you know, of wanting to really be uh, empathetic to people and, and help. Uh, and, you know, when I started, obviously we had to go sit down with, you know, docs like yourself and, you know, get the psychological assessments and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I don't know if they, do they, do they still do that by the way? I mean, in today's world, are they still, are most agencies giving psychological evaluations as a whole? Do you know? They're, they're doing written, written testing still, most of them. Hmm. Yeah, the, the MMP, what's it called, MMPI or something? Yeah, the MMPI. But you know what? It's That's so derivative. I mean, I'm not saying that the MMPI is not a good tool. Yeah, but I'm just saying right. that that can't be the that can't be the main tool. I mean, I use the yeah. MMPI all the time, but it's one of like 20 tools that I use. And okay. I have I have become concerned sometimes when they just like judge a person based on their MMPI. I'm like, hey guys, the test is not perfect. Also, again, it's very um, reductionistic. It just boils people down into profiles and numbers. And sometimes people don't even understand the question and they answer it some way and up. Oh, there goes their psychopath scale. It's elevated. <laughs> most, not most, senior, most senior officers, when that test came out, openly said, I would have never been hired as a police officer if I had to take that test because, uh, uh, because of, of the uh, questions and the way it's formulated. But Oh, I know. And some of the questions are still so old school, like the way that they're written. I mean, I know that they're doing updates all the time. Actually, the MMPI-3 is coming out this month. So uh, I think it's going to contain some updates and hopefully it'll become even a stronger and more robust test. But, you know, as, as great as the MMPI is, it has its limitations. And I actually have been brought in before um, as like the outside evaluator once somebody, because of their psych testing, didn't get further into the process of being hired by a police department. So they have to hire somebody on the outside to like do their psych evaluation. And then I've seen some of the psych evaluations and it's made me worried. I'm like, really? It was an interview in the MMPI and now this person can't be a cop? Like that sucks. Um, so I, I feel like sometimes bad decisions have been made based on the use of that test. For well, maybe I was one of them, but I, uh, so far I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm doing, <laughs> yeah. So long story short, I, um, when I went through my thing and got to, um, you know, a career where I started seeing some of those traumatic things, right? And I started processing that. For me, it, it was a couple of things. It was, you know, I never liked my, I didn't want to be that guy that hung out, you know, and just, you know, did cop stuff, right? I didn't want to cut my lawn with my badge and my gun belt on, right? As we mm -hmm. used to say, okay? So for me, I have this artistic side. So I've been playing guitar since 1972. So I just go off and like last night, I mean, Mike called me and I was sitting on the front porch for like 45 minutes just playing guitar. I, I called him Andy Taylor. I asked if Opie was there. <laughs> he did. I live in South Carolina and I'm sitting on the porch just, you know, strumming away and my phone rings yeah. and it's Mike, you know, you know, and I'm like, uh, what are you? He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, playing my guitar. Why are you calling me? I'm teasing. But, I said, uh, hey, Goober says, hey. <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of that's kind of my thing. You know, I have this artistic mm -hmm. side that uh, I yeah. think really filled that void for me. So I totally hear that. I've been playing uh, music since I was four. And oh. so, yeah, playing the piano and singing. I mean, those are definitely my stress relievers. And like you said, just tapping into any creative side in general. Um, I've definitely had fantasies of like running off with a circus sometimes when I've been stressed a, a lot, a lot harder to do that now in the pandemic. Cause I don't think any circus shows are actually going to be performing anytime soon. Um, but I, but I totally hear that. And, and by the way, you guys, the psychoanalysis has started obviously. And you, as okay. you can see, and I have, and I have more questions for you as I'm hearing you talking, what, what motivated 
Yeah. What motivated both of you to go into your careers and, and to be involved in law enforcement? Like what was the spark that got that going for you? So for me, uh, I'll start on this one, Mike. For me, it was, um, I had a, a, my son, my younger son, uh, I saw a car pull up and the passenger door opened and my, he was a young boy at the time. And, um, I ran out of the house and I went after this guy and the car took mm -hmm. off. My son did not get in the car, but for me, it was very personal. And I, and I made a deal, you know, I, I made a deal with God and I said, you give me an opportunity to hunt these guys down. I'll hunt them down for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And that I've been doing it, you know, next thing you know it, I'm in the police Academy in 1982, you know, getting yelled at by a bunch of crazy people. And I'm thinking, what did I do? You know, but mm -hmm. uh, teasing, but, uh, but that's how it started for me. I, it, it was just, wow. you know, ingrained in me from that moment. I thought, I thought I needed to do something about it. So how old were you? Uh, when I started 21. Yeah. 21. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you knew from a pretty early age that this is what you wanted to do. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. I have good genes. I was born in. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mike? What made you want to get started in this career? Oh, brother. I, well, well I, I was living somewhat of a misspent youth in, uh, in downtown Salt Lake City, and uh, my mother had uh, gone through a divorce recently, it was not my father, um, so a number of divorces, but was probably not making the best of decisions. I remember I was playing uh, football for the South High Cubs in Salt Lake City, and that was my junior year. I was in the weight room lifting weights, and this uh, guy with a big, long handlebar mustache walked in and started talking to me. He ended up being a Salt Lake City police officer. And uh, it was the precursor to the um, youth programs in the schools that Salt Lake City had launched. And uh, he befriended me. And I later learned he picked up uh, a bad apple and was trying to shine it up a little bit. And, and uh, he had such an influence. His name was Nils Niemans. He lives up in Idaho now, uh, running a potato farm, uh, retired and has a wonderful life, but uh, influenced me so positively that uh, that I by the time I was out of high school I knew that that was something that I wanted to do wow it there you go. really speaks to the it really speaks to the power of role models and mentors right showing you what's possible and giving you an example to look up to and I think that some people are not lucky necessarily to have those mentors and positive role models necessarily in their own immediate family but there's always a chance for a do-over you can always meet somebody um, on your walk of life where they can inspire you to do something and um, and give you a different idea of a different type of life or a different type of career. So I, I love hearing your stories. Thank you for allowing me to interview you guys. I feel like that's what we've been doing for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> so Doc, why did you choose to do what you do? And so you clearly I'm are an overachiever because it wasn't just one board certification. You had to get three board certifications. So and yeah, and right. win on the price is right no way yes, yes. <laughs> we must talk about that story that's my most proud crowning achievement to date um but but to answer your first question i actually knew i wanted to be a psychologist when i was in high school because at the time i was 15 and i was a mentor in the big brother and big sister program and uh -huh. i don't know I mean, I thought that that was an interesting thing to do. It sounded like a helpful thing to do. But what did I know? I was a 15-year-old, and I was just thinking, this is a great volunteer idea. But they assigned me this 10-year-old um, foster child. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't fathom. She had been out of like a dozen group homes by the time she was 10. She had this severe trauma history. And they're like, here you go. Here's who you're supposed to mentor. And I'm, I'm thinking, what can I give to this child's life? But it was amazing because all I did was just show up every Wednesday at the same time to like take her to the movie or get ice cream with her or go on a walk in the park. And it's just this idea of consistently showing up that really helped her to get on a better trajectory. She started to trust more people. You know, I had maybe a two year time frame with her where I was officially her mentor in the program before I graduated high school. 
And in that time, I saw her start to turn her life around. And actually, to this day, we still sometimes keep in touch. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. And so I, it just made me realize, even at that time, one person can make such a big difference in a person's life. And sometimes you don't even know what you're doing because I didn't know what I was doing when I was 15. And it just made me think, but what if I actually got training? How many more people could I help, right? And I'm just really lucky that even though I thought of that at age 15 and that was the spark, um, that I got to follow it through and I got to become a psychologist, which was what I really wanted to, to do ever since then. Wow, that's fantastic. Why, why, why the criminal side though? What, what about the criminal mind that fascinated you? Well, was there you know, a technology I'm, that uh, kind of led you that way? Yeah, you know, I think that I'm very equally split in terms of the way my mind works between being a scientist and a clinician. Like there's a part of me that really wants to understand the intellectual underbelly of things. But then there's the other side of me that just loves people and, and wants to help people from a humanistic perspective. And I think being a forensic neuropsychologist was the perfect combination because every single person is like a little case that you have to solve. You have to figure out what's going on with this person and figure out what makes them tick, figure out what their diagnoses are and prescribe a good treatment plan that makes sense given how they're presenting. And so I think that's why I became really interested in forensics and just in general dealing with individuals with severe mental disabilities and illnesses because it's the idea of you know i really want to figure this out so that we can really help this person who maybe in the past they haven't gotten uh, the opportunities to really get everything looked at and really understand what they're all about and also by the way i really love working with other professionals you know you mentioned, you mentioned my three boys hey, hey doc yeah, yeah. I, I hate to interrupt you. Something goofy is happening with your mic. It's uh, oh. maybe it's a bandwidth issue or something for just a second. We'll give that a, okay. a second to catch up and uh, see if we can do that. And um, while while we're waiting for that, um, I just want to mention, folks, thank you so much for supporting us tonight. Um, we, we hope that you'll hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so that you get those notifications. We're with Dr. Judy Ho a board certified uh, psychologist and and uh, neuropsychologist I, I need to say uh, we have been talking about all kinds of things most particularly this uh, whole idea of the personalities of a police investigation and uh and we're just thrilled to have you here doc so if maybe you could recap where you were and we'll see if that solved your mic problem yeah i just changed to a different mic so hopefully it's a little better but um yeah i was just saying that there's a part of me that's a scientist there's a part of me that's a clinician and on top of that i love learning from other experts um, i love collaborating with other experts whether it's the police force or attorneys or other types of doctors um it's a learning process every time i'm on a forensic case and i get to learn something from it too and it helps me to become a better expert in the future so that's what I really love. And I adore the things that you guys are doing. And that's why it's been such an honor that you guys are having me on your show. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We're blown away that you're, you know, that you're here and, and our, our get our, our audience here, they absolutely love you. And thank you so much for just taking your time to come and visit with us. I mean, we're, you're not going anywhere yet. Cause I know you're going to answer some questions, right? Are you, are you still up for that doc? I'm you think, so Mike, we should head yeah, that way? Yeah, for everybody? I want to just maybe um, just ask you to, to maybe make a statement on one thing. Uh, so, Dr. Ho, this week is going to be really important for the Mormon family, uh, oh, Suzanne's yeah. uh, family who has organized this search. There are a lot of really good hearted people who are giving up their time and talent mm -hmm. to go out and support Andy and go out and look. Um, uh, there are some people who are out there saying the obvious that they may not find Suzanne, but why is it so important that Andy Morphew, I mean, that Andy Mormon step up and, and do this, organize this and put forth this effort. And as a clinician, what kind of advice and counsel do you have for that group of people? Well, I think Mormon has said himself, he will never forgive himself if he doesn't try. And I think both you, you, Chris and Mike, you both know that as the days tick forward, the chances of actually recovering her are going to be less and less and less. And so it's kind of now or never. And I think people are wanting to help because everybody wants to feel empowered, especially right now. I mean, in general, I think there's a lot of good humans out there. 
But I think, especially right now, given what's going on in our world and in our country, it just feels so important to be able to step in and do something, you know, take control of something. And yeah. I think everybody's just going to feel so good about being part of the process. I think my word of caution is that, you know, when we have a lot of these volunteer, um, good hearted people, they're not necessarily prepared for what they might see if they were to find evidence. So we saw this with 9-11, right? That's a when, good point. That's a really solid point. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, you. you're not. Um, I'm glad mm -hmm. that I'm on the right track. I mean, during 9-11, there were amazing volunteers. People came from everywhere, all walks of life. And what did we find? We found that right afterwards when they did a trauma study, the people who were the most traumatized were the civilians, you know, again, because they were not trained or prepared for this, whereas the firefighters, the paramedics, the policemen and women, their rates of PTSD from cleaning up 9-11 was actually a bit lower, even though obviously it's extremely traumatizing for everyone. But it's like they, they know it's part of the job, right, versus somebody who, you know, works at, uh, at an office most of the time and they're they're joining the search. And if they find something truly disturbing, they're gonna need some support too. Yeah, this this is really important. And one of the interesting things, Doc, that has troubled us, we're, we're now glad to see the sheriff and Colorado Bureau of Investigation stepping up to provide some support to Andy, but it can't be some support. It needs to be real direction from professionals that this group of people that are doing the right thing have solid um, support and leadership from government as they go out there. How, how important do you think that is of the government to step up and support them in this? I think it's really important. And I think that it is an opportunity for them to show a different type of leadership. And in, in some ways to show gratitude for the community banding together because you know, for example, the local law enforcement has said, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to lead the search for a number of different reasons, but we want to try to support this effort as much as possible. So instead of just supporting with manpower or finances, they should be supporting with resources and especially mental health resources. Like they should be having trauma counseling available for some of these individuals, because I think your adrenaline's going when you're doing a search. I, don't, I mean, you guys have you guys have more knowledge about this than anyone because of the actual work you do. But I think just any regular civilian walking around the woods thinking that they could turn a corner and find something, human remains possibly, blood splotches, this is not what the average person is, is used to being, uh, being able to deal with. And that's the kind of thing that happens in terms of how trauma exists in the body is that usually it's because it's such a shock to the system that that's why the trauma becomes stuck. And then if you don't get professional support, you might not process it as fast. Yeah, no. that's real. That is such a solid, solid, solid point. And, uh, you know, the last thing I think anybody wants is, uh, you know, those types of results, right? Um, it, uh, you know, it, but we are kind of surprised that, um, you know, the sheriff has stepped up and said, yeah, you know, we'll kind of, we'll be there. Uh, but, you know, w w I guess Mike and I just have a different perspective and, you know, um, it, it's the role, it's the role of government to, you know, when you have a family member um, who is just looking for their sister and says, you know, Hey, I need your help and support. Uh, I mean, what agency would not want, a, you know, a volunteer force of 500 people and then, you know, appropriately vet them like you're talking about to say, okay, you know, you folks can walk up the road. That's, you know, we're, we're not going to worry about that. But I mean, we used to call, you know, for volunteers all the time in missing people cases. And, you know, especially kids, as you know, I mean, it, we're in San Diego County, you know, we had the mountains, right? And, you know, I can, you know, the search and rescue folks would call for volunteers. You get five, 600 people show up uh, and everybody would do a grid search, you know, you know straight line and, and, and march. Um, and, and all of those resources were in place, like you're talking about, in case something, you know, uh, drastic were to, you know, be recovered or something to that effect. So we're just hoping that CBI and the sheriff's department down there, you know, Sheriff, Sheriff Speezy, uh, you know, steps up to the plate in 100% and uh, really supports this effort uh, this week. So 
Um, looks like we well, have a question. Yeah, let's ask some questions. So, Doc, they got to okay. know what happened on uh -oh. The Price is Right. Uh, Deborah Fells is asking. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, Deborah, thank you for your question. So, this was 10 years ago, and I was in the audience of Price is Right. So, in case anybody is wondering how they pick their contestants, it's truly random in that you show up and they just pick you. But I'm also sure that they probably pick people who they think is going to make a good show. And I was jumping up and down. In <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure they targeted me. They're like, we need to get that person. She seems super excited to be on the show. Um, so, anyway, I was the last person called down to contestant row. Um, and then I was the closest to, to guess what was on stage without going over. So then I went and I spin the wheel. Well, actually I played a game first. I won that game. Then I spun the wheel. I got closest to a dollar without going over. <laughs> so then I ended up, um, at the showcase showdown and it was pretty amazing. 10 minutes of my Boom! life. <laughs> yeah. I was like 10 minutes and, uh, basically I ended up winning double showcase. And I'm the third highest uh, third. winner, third highest winner of Ever. Price is Right history Yep. right now, I think. So that was, I mean, again, blew my so mind. You lifetime rice -a -roni or what, what does that mean? That, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> okay. Here's what I won. Here's what I won. I was like the rain man. I was doing math in my head. <laughs> but, but my showcase had a car, a bunch of video games, TV. I mean, PlayStation. And the crazy thing is... I know the prices of all those things and I'm a video game fanatic. So yeah, yeah. I was actually counting in my head. Well, you're like, the age of Atari, right? Yes. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Go. Absolutely. Go. Nintendo and 64 Pong. and Pong. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so anyway, I got within $120 of my showcase and that's when you win both of them. So I won oh. a, a car, a boat, and three trips, one to Cancun, one to Greece, and one to Norway. I won all the oh, video games, goodness. a TV. Goodness. Yeah, it was crazy. So anyway, if anybody's interested, if you just go on YouTube and type in uh, Christmas Christmas Miracle 2010, The Price is Right, you'll see a bunch of videos of my So room. cool. <laughs> we got to put, put that up. So I got to ask, did you did you hike Preikstolen in Norway when you were there? Uh, you know what? I didn't actually get to those areas of Norway. I was mostly in Oslo, but I was really tempted to actually like go up further and actually get to see more of more of that beautiful country. Cause that was a really, it's a, such a pristine country. I've never seen a city that pristine. Oh, it's crazy. incredible. I'll send you a photo of, of uh, me uh, inching along the cliff to Preikstol and uh, the Norwegian Aww. police took me out there to pay me off for some training that I did over there. And it was uh, an incredible experience, but uh, you'll have to get our, there. A lot of our folks here are from Europe. So <clears throat> oh, they, cool. they watch us all over. Yeah, we're, it's pretty interesting. So uh, what are the kind of questions we got going here? So the, what, what what, another one that I think has been interesting, and it came early on, Dr. Ho, that I, I'd love to hear. Um, there, there's a lot of concern about the 30-second or 20-second video that Barry posted initially when Suzanne disappeared. And then this complete, uh, period of silence. What, what, what are your thoughts on something like that? Well, I've seen this in other cases where there's a lot of this weird viral justice that happens with the person of interest in the beginning where they're basically all over the map on Facebook, posting videos, testimonials, like you're barking up the wrong tree. I'm completely innocent. I mean, whatever the content of their video is, or I love my wife. I love my husband. How dare you accuse me? And then they go silent because they realize that it's not helping and it's actually hurting matters. And perhaps they've wised up a little bit and realize that everything can and will be used against you. And nowadays right. we got social media to use against people. I mean, this is one of the things that has blown my mind, right? When somebody, and this is mostly in civil cases, but it happens in criminal cases, obviously as well, where for example, in a civil case, somebody will say, okay, I've had this accident and then I've had no life. I don't go out with friends. I can't even walk, you know, I'm paralyzed because of this accident. And then the, in court, they'll just show pages and pages of Facebook photos and videos. Well, here you are at a party last weekend. Here you are walking around dancing. And their case is completely blown. And yeah. I think sometimes people recognize that. And maybe Barry is starting to wise up just a little bit. 
Interesting. Really interesting. So Barb Nauman asked, uh, Doc, she goes, what is the difference between a compulsive and pathological liar? So there's two questions here. And the second, can they be treated? Okay. So a compulsive liar can be somebody who lies because they're trying to cover up something that they're struggling with. That could be a possibility. So somebody could compulsively lie because they have an addiction. For example, they have an addiction to gambling or to video games or to the internet or to alcohol or to drugs. And so they compulsively lie because they're hiding their addiction and they're maybe sometimes even ashamed of it. Um, sometimes people compulsively lie because they want to feel better about themselves. So they make up these fantastical stories where they're amazing and they try to get attention and support. A pathological liar is much more nefarious. That's somebody who's doing it to hurt other people or to drive their own agendas. So not just to cover up their own insecurities or their addiction, but they're lying because they they're doing it on purpose to hurt somebody because they see other human beings as pawns in their game and they enjoy one upping somebody and they enjoy tricking people. So can they be treated? Well, compulsive liars can then be treated a little bit easier than pathological liars. I don't want to say that there's no hope for pathological liars, but they really have to want it for themselves. And the problem is, as we've been talking about in this case, um, if the person always deflects responsibility, they'll never go to treatment. And even if they go, it's really just to accomplish something like to get a checkbox, you know, to, to pass probation or whatever. So it's not going to be coming from a real place. And if that happens, then they're not going to be able to really correct that problem. So if somebody says that they're out every single day looking for their significant other, but they're actually out elk hunting uh, over the weekend, where, where does that fit with inside of those two, uh, that uh, yeah. analogy? Well, I would definitely say that there's something about Barry's behavior that makes me think that he just wants to be washed clean of the entire mess. I've actually seen cases where the person of interest actually does become convicted later and even they know to put up the pretenses, you know, in this phase, meaning they're joining the search efforts, right? They're, they're maybe <laughs> leading it, you know, right. again, because they're thinking maybe this will make me look better to the police. Scott Peterson did that, didn't he? Yeah. yeah remember? Oh, wasn't he like just the most, I mean, again, he was so he was charming. At her vigil, he was at his, at her vigil. Yeah. Right. Where oh. they were lighting candles and, and Scott's oh. right there calling the, the mistress saying he's in Paris. Yeah. Okay. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, so. I, I do. And I, and I yeah. also remember that even after he was convicted that he got love letters in prison yeah. because oh, yeah. apparently people don't learn their lesson. I mean, do they want to be the next victim? But it's so crazy. Right. And he's not the only one. There's a lot of other people who become convicted of their uh, spouse's murders and then they get all these love letters. I believe you. I can save you. I love you. Yeah. Yeah, what's that all about? I mean, what what is? I mean, I don't want to go down that road in totality because we'll be here for days. I know. Okay, but I this know. is fascinating. This is fa where where does that come from? Well, yeah. In fact, we actually. I, I mean, I, I I interviewed Richard Ramirez one day, and he told me I'm still getting 300 letters a month from people who want to marry me and and create a life with me. Uh, how, how do you explain that, Doc? Oh. Well, I guess she doesn't, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> she left it up to us. Yeah. No, no, and, and no. you know, I, I you Don't remember that anywhere, experience, everybody. Chris. That was an amazing thing. So, folks, Richard Ramirez, if you remember, this is the night stalker responsible. Some people think 28 murders or so, but he terrorized Southern California and uh, and uh, was finally convicted and sent and uh, spent the rest of his life at San Quentin on death row. But every single month, he would receive, on average, 300 letters from primarily women all over the world who either thought they could change him or they just wanted to be married. And I remember he smiling and sliding a letter across the table to me that said, uh, oh, good, here we got Dr. <laughs> Dr. Hoback. <laughs> we we decided you didn't want to answer. <laughs> I take the fifth. No, um, no, actually, I had a good answer for that one because I've had been asked this question so many times and it seems inexplicable, but it's really not. I think one thing is 
um, in some ways, all of the news coverage on TV um, has glamorized these individuals. They're kind of our new celebrities, like our new reality TV stars. And yeah. so you kind of start to, uh, you know, admire them the way that we admire celebrities. And then I think there's also the people who, you know, whether you're a male or a female, some people have that like hero mentality. They want to save people. And then they start to think that these people need saving. Like if they just had proper person to love them, then they would change. Like, and they would be these loving people. They're just misunderstood. Right. Um, so I think that those two reasons for sure. And then the third reason is unfortunately, if they've been through some trauma themselves, and oftentimes they'll be attracted to people who represent chaos, you know, it's kind of like the devil, you know, and you just keep falling for the same person over and over again. And I would venture that those people, this would not be the first semi-criminal or criminal that they've fallen in love with, you know? So they, tra so they, so do they transfer their own behavior into the behaviors that they're seeing? Is yeah, that what you're it, saying? Yes. And, and in some ways they get their self-esteem from, um, you know, getting people like this that seem completely unmovable and unshakable to the public to change. And then, and then that becomes their crowning achievement. Like it actually bolsters their self-esteem if they can uh -huh. actually mold this person into like a positive individual. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Dr. Ho, what kind of advice do you have for police officers today as they deal with violent crime, not just day in, day out police work, um, mm -hmm. but for the officer that's dealing with violent crime, what, what kind of advice do you have for them? Well, I would say that, you know, from what I understand, and of course I'm on the outside, but I do have friends who are in law enforcement. My best friend works in law enforcement. And I, I think that there is still that culture of you gotta be strong. Like don't talk about these things because that's just normal. Like you gotta be able to handle it. And I, you know, as a psychologist, I would love to see that culture change. And I think that does have to come from the top levels too, where they're saying it's okay to have these conversations. We're going to have mental health awareness days. We're going to start providing you with uh, professional resources and they should be anonymous. So they don't feel like they're judged when they call this number or, or hook up with a therapist to get services, right? They really need to be able to do that and, and be encouraged to do that. And also be told that, you're going to have some extreme reactions and maybe you'll be humming along for 15 years dealing with violent crimes, no, nothing. And then there's always that one case for whatever reason, it just really hits you and you start to have more of a stress reaction to it. And I just think that we need to be more proactive, I think, in encouraging them and letting them know this is going to be a reality of your job. At some point, you're probably going to need a professional to talk through some stuff and don't be afraid to do it. And you're not going to be negatively judged for it. Yeah, that's a that's a really fascinating um, insight because, you know, I think we've lost a, a little civility uh, right now. I mean, I, I think we can gain it back. I mean, I I I, I want to believe that, uh, you know, we're kind of just in a cycle of mm -hmm. where people are kind of measuring off. And and I I I think social media has been a real game changer. I mean, and, and this and you know this channel is a perfect example of that. I mean. Who would have thought 10 years ago that, you know, a couple of retired guys would be sitting on a YouTube channel with, you know, a forensic psychologist like you talking about, you know, issues of the day. Uh, and but it yeah. just shows, you know, where, you know, we have come and where we're headed. But what, what really, I think, really worries me, it doesn't necessarily worry me, but it, it does, is this idea that. We, we, we just can't be friendly anymore. Yeah. And, you know, we're, it's just so quick to, you know, go after, you know, the cops or the, you know, the firefighters. I mean, even f who would want to be a fireman today? Oh, you I know? know. I mean, or paramedic. I mean, they, when, you know, these guys are talking about wearing bulletproof vest. I mean, right. are you serious? You know, yeah. these are, they're here to help and, and to put you in the ambulance and get you to the trauma center. What do you, and so um, I just hope that, uh, you know, we get to a better place uh, as a society. And I, I'm grateful that there's, you know, good people such as yourself that are on the, on the other side of the coin. And so I scratch my head every once in a while and just go, well, you know, you're not going to fix that, but uh, you know, I have a saying, good luck with that, you know, take care. You know, yeah. you, so. It's a really, it's a really good point, Chris. And I know we have to wrap up, but I think yeah. my one, one last thought as I was listening to you is that, you know, 
right now there's just so much unrest. There's so much frustration and anger in the world of psychology is one of the most, uh, basically the most primal of emotions. It's like when you don't have a more sophisticated emotion or a more sophisticated coping strategy, you just take out your anger on whoever is an easy target. And sadly, some of our public officials have become easy targets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And really just anyone. I mean, so yeah, really? public officials, your, your loved ones, your family members, your children, your spouse. I mean, everybody's reporting that, that they're having more discord inside the family as well as out. And so I do agree that it's becoming a, a, a pandemic in and of itself. And we have to find some way to, to get along and to hopefully find proactive solutions to the problems that we're seeing in our systems. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I totally agree with you 100%. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Dr. Ho, we have been really richly blessed having you with us tonight. Will you please come back? Please. Yes, I would yes. love to. That we would, would so love fun. we would love that. Folks, you can see how to to uh, follow Dr. Judy Ho and uh, please you can continue the discussion in uh, Discord after let's put her book we invite up you. Let's put her book yeah, up. let's let's put that back up. Oh, you know what? We may not be able to, but we do have it posted um, in the in description below. Uh, and please go out and buy that book, and uh, and just vicariously assume that she's signed that over to you, uh, or find <laughs> her somewhere on the street walking at night, and uh, maybe she'll sign it then. We're so appreciative of you. Please make sure you're subscribing that you're ringing the bell and consider those memberships. That's a place where we can just talk a little more and share a little more. And Dr. Ho, we'll look forward to having you back hopefully very yep. soon. And please yep. watch uh, Monday nights is our choir practice. And that's <laughs> where we just have a little fun. Uh, we're going to get a little update on the search that comes out next week. Mm -hmm. And to those of you who are giving your time and talent, we wish you the very best as you go out and support the Mormon family. And uh, hopefully that you are wise and safe. And until we have a chance to meet you all again, thanks and have a great evening. Thank you.